Biblical chronology dates the world as being less than 6,000 years old. Science, based on various geological and astrophysical observations, dates the world as being at least 15 billion years old. The gap is tremendous and obviously unbridgeable. Or is it? Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who holds a dual doctorate in nuclear physics and oceanography from MIT and served on the Atomic Regulatory Commission, demonstrates that the figures are not only reconcilable, but points out that the biblical account of creation is remarkably close to that of modern science. So this session deals with the age of the universe. Among the many questions that exist in the idea of science and the Bible possibly being in conflict, one of the baselines is the age of the universe. Is it billions of years, like scientific data, or is it thousands of years, like biblical data? When we add up the generations of the Bible, we come to something less than 6,000 years. Get the data from the Hubble telescope, from the land earth-based telescopes in Hawaii, we find numbers reaching 15 billion years. Alan Sandage a few months ago uh, had a press conference and he says from all of the data he has seen, and he's certainly one of the major f persons involved in this, the age of the universe appears to be something a bit over 15 billion years old, 15,000 million years. So, I mean, that might seem as a conflict between 6,000 years. So it's interesting to look at the historical perspective because in trying to understand the idea of science in conflict with the Bible, which, which is the whole series that I, that I teach, it's instructive to look at trends in knowledge because absolute proofs are not coming. But what is available is to look how science has changed its picture of the world relative to the unchanging picture of the Torah. The Torah doesn't have the option of changing unless you use modern interpretations where the attempt might be to bend the Bible to match science or bend science to match the Bible. Now that subjectivity is hard to avoid because we all see the world through the filters of our brain. And so with no question we all implant on reality our subjective realization of what that reality is about. So to try to minimize this at least, since I can't avoid it, but to minimize it, I restrict myself in all these discussions, whether it's the age of the universe, whether it's the information on the evolution of life, whether it's on the origin of mankind, the origin of free will, I restrict myself to two sets of information. Peer-reviewed scientific literature that is used in universities around the world. I mean, I have a vested interest in this since I spent many years at MIT getting my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate, and seven years on the staff of the physics department after. So I don't have the option of being flaky as far as physics goes because I have my reputation to be careful of. On the other hand, from biblical interpretation, if I want to avoid subjectivity, I don't want to use modern peer-reviewed commentary because modern commentary already knows modern science. And so it's influenced by that always. So the only data I use as far as biblical commentary goes is ancient commentary. And that would be the text of the Bible itself about 3,300 years ago the translation of the Torah into Aramaic by Onkelos in about the year 100, that predates the redaction of the Talmud. Then the Talmud itself redacted about the year 500, in other words, 1,500 years ago, it's fixed. Then the three major commentators, there are many, many commentators, but at the top of the mountain of biblical commentators, there are three accepted by all. Rashi, who brings down the straight understanding of the text in about the year 1050. About the year 1190, Maimonides, the great philosopher who handles with philosophical concepts. And then about 60 years after him, in approximately the year 1250, Nachmanides, the Ramban. Maimonides, the Rambam, with an M at the end. Nachmanides, the Ramban, with an N at the end. Okay, so those are the commentators. So there's only ancient commentary hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, long before Hubble was a gleam in his great-grandparents' eyes. So there's no possibility of Hubble data or other scientific data influencing these concepts, okay? So that's the background of the test, an attempt to try to make the following discussion somewhat objective, minimizing subjectivity. In 1959, a survey was taken of leading United States scientists. 
And among the many questions asked was, what is your understanding of the age of the universe? Now, 1959, cosmology was just becoming a science, okay? Astronomy was there, but cosmology, the deep physics of understanding the universe, was just developing. The response to that survey, as far as the, of the one question I'm interested in, the age of the universe, was re recently republished in Scientific American, the most widely read science journal in the world. Two-thirds of the scientists gave the same answer as to what is their opinion of the age of the universe. The answer was not 6,000 years, I assure you. The answer was much larger than that. The answer that two-thirds of the scientists gave was beginning? There was no beginning. The Greeks taught us that, Aristotle and Plato, 2,400 years ago. The universe is eternal. Oh, we know the Bible says in the beginning, the opening word. That's a nice story. It helps kids go to bed at night. You know, it makes them feel safe. There was a beginning. But we, sophisticates, know better. There was no beginning. That was 1959. In 1965, Penzias and Wilson discovered the echo of the Big Bang in the temperature and the black of the sky at night. And the world paradigm changed from a universe that was eternal to a universe that had a beginning. Science will never be able to make a greater change in its understanding of the world relative to the Bible than the fact that we now know the first word of the Bible is correct. There was a beginning. The fact that there was a beginning does not prove that there was a beginner. You should understand that. Physics allows a beginning without a beginner. I'm not going to get into that today, but I spent a lot of verbiage on that in uh, The Science of God. What is important, though, is having a beginning, first of all, demonstrates the first half of the sentence to be correct. Whether the second half of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is true, we don't know from a secular point of view. The first half being in the beginning. The second half is God created the heavens and the earth. Evolution, cavemen, they're all trivial problems to the fact that we now understand that we had a beginning. The question then to answer is, how long ago did the beginning occur? Was it, as the Bible might imply, less than 6,000 years? Or was it indeed the 15 billions of years that's accepted by the scientific community? So the first thing we have to understand is the origin of the biblical calendar. I mean, if, that's, if the calendar is the problem, it would be nice to know something about the calendar. We get to the, 6, the 57, 58 years in 1997. 3,758 years by adding up the generations since Adam. There are six days leading from the creation to Adam, and then we have the time following Adam. Adding up the generations in the Bible, and then adding to that the rulers that follow the end of the biblical text, we come to a number a bit less than 6,000 years. Of course, the question would be is where we make the zero point. It's not obvious from the text, okay? On Rosh Hashanah, the new year, Rosh, Head, Ha, the Shana year, the head of the year, the new year, in the additional service called the Musaf service, it's the longest service of the year. Now, the tendency is, if you're not into the litur liturgy, to like to let your mind wander. So the sages that formed the Mahsur understood that was happening. So three times through the service, we blow the shofar, the ram's horn. And immediately following the blowing of the shofar, when everyone is wide awake and paying attention, the following sentence is made, Hayom Harat Olam. This is the birthday of the world. Three times repeated at each of the major actions of the day, the blowing of the shofar, this is the birthday of the world, Hayom Harat Olam. Which might lead you to think that Rosh Hashanah commemorates the creation of the universe. But it doesn't. Rosh Hashanah does commemorate a creation, but not the creation of the universe. It commemorates the last of the three creations that occur in the six days of Genesis. There's a creation that brings into being the heavens, the, the entire universe and the laws of nature. And then on day five, there's a creation that brings us the nephesh, the soul of animal life. And then on day six, at the end, there's a further creation that brings us the neshama, the soul of human life. All humans have a nephesh and a neshama. Animals have a nephesh. And Rosh Hashanah commemorates not the first of the creations of the universe, but the creation of the neshama, the soul of human life. Rosh Hashanah falls right here. 
which means that we start counting the 5,758